I'm Adrian Schneer, Advancement Coach and Strategist, Lawyer and Professor, and you're listening to the Advancement Spot Podcast, the podcast all about academic and professional skills, strategy, and mindset to help you make big moves to achieve a life beyond your wildest dreams. If you're looking to accomplish more and take your next steps with supportive and experience-informed strategies, look no further. Let's get started. Hi, welcome to the Advancement Spot Podcast. I'm your host, Adrienne Schneer, and I am so grateful that you've taken time out of your busy day to spend some here with us. I am so happy to welcome our guest today to the podcast. Today, we're speaking with Rick Frank, one of my dear colleagues and law school peers. We were in the same section. Rick is currently a criminal defense lawyer at a firm in Toronto called FOTA Law. And we'll be chatting today about Rick's journey to and through law school and beyond. So, Rick, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. So I'd love to begin by learning a little bit more about what you're doing now. Tell me about yourself and what you do. Yeah, like you said, I'm a criminal defense lawyer in Toronto. Our office does serious criminal matters. We do drugs, stuff, guns, organized crime, really serious criminal stuff. I also work at Fair Change. It's a charity legal clinic in Toronto does a lot of work with the homeless and uh, underhoused who have received provincial tickets and are facing enormous fines and trying to get back on their feet. I have two cats. They climb all over me all the time and (laughs) will climb all over me during this episode. They're welcome. Everybody's welcome (laughs) in the podcast. Everyone's welcome. (laughs) Excellent. (laughs) So if we could begin by reflecting on your journey and how you came to this place, what are your reflections on on your journey and and what really led you to this place as a defense as a criminal defense lawyer? I think what primarily led me was seeing a lot of people when I was younger, when I was especially between 15 to 17, myself being arrested, a lot of my friends getting arrested, my brother was arrested. So I saw a lot of young black people getting arrested and it was a powerless feeling having known nothing about the law, having no family in law, seeing that happen to me a lot and to people around me, that really motivated me to make sure I have a profession in law. So can you tell me a bit more about what what that was like for you, how that experience really began the foundation for your journey into law? Yeah, well, I was 16. Some white kid at my school called me the N-word over the phone. I went to go confront him about it. And honestly, I don't know what the confrontation would have looked like at the end of the day. But one of the guys that I was with punched him in the face and took his hat. And I told my friend to stop and I pulled him off of me, pulled him off of him. And ultimately, four hours later, police showed up at my house and they told me I was under arrest for a robbery. I knew nothing about law. My mom knew nothing about law. My brother was arrested before by this point. So he had a negative experience. Same police force, same police division, actually. And ultimately resolved, I was able to do some courses and enter a peace bond. But for me, that was a foundational point because I really, really, really felt powerless and couldn't do anything about it. And there was no one on my side. And so after this experience that you had, which is traumatizing, after this experience, you decided, okay, I'm going to make the world a better place in some way. Yeah. I, I mean, at the time, I was kind of tinkering with the idea of becoming a police officer. I knew I wanted to get into justice in some way. I was not really interested in probation and parole and that kind of stuff. So it was really maybe a lawyer, maybe a police officer, but something in that area. But at that time, when that happened, my brother was arrested and all that stuff happened. I knew I can't be on the side that puts people who look like me behind bars And it puts handcuffs on people who look like me. So for me, that was a foundational point of it. Mm -hmm. And so what was so what do you enjoy about the work that you do now? Stuff that I enjoy is that I am able to challenge the state. I'm able to keep the state accountable. I'm able to help people who probably feel like me, felt like me at 16 or powerless, who have no idea what's happening. No one's in their corner. Their family aren't lawyers. And so for me, it's being able to help someone in that position navigate the system and be able to get them the best resolution. And also use your position to help empower others. It is. It's a big part of empowerment. I really did not feel empowered throughout the criminal justice system. 
now I do feel empowered. I now have the knowledge. I now have the know-how to be able to assist and help people feel empowered, have their voice heard, get the remedies that they deserve when they are falsely arrested or they're racially profiled or, or whatever happens to them. And so after that experience, what did your journey look like after that experience? Well, after that, after that experience, I went to undergrad, but essentially from 16 to 18, maybe till 19, I got pulled over by police 10 times, I think, maybe wow. 11. And I stopped driving when I was 19 because I was going to school. And I lived near the schools. So I didn't need to drive. But essentially, from the time I started driving at 16 to 19, when I stopped driving, harassed by police, I had my car surrounded by police a lot of times. Or not, sorry, once. When I had my car surrounded, but other times I was just pulled over for no reason, harassed. And I was like, this is just the life of being a black man in Ontario. So when I went to undergrad, I had a real motivation to, one, not drive, but two, make sure I'm able to get to a point that I don't have to continue to feel like this. You finished high school. And after that, you went into justice studies. I did. Yes. And, and so how was that program for you? The program for me was fantastic. I mean, Guelph Humber is not going to win any provincial awards for being the best university in the province, but it should win an award for having a program that is structured in a, in a way that allows you to really learn about yourself, really grow. I had a lot of profs who were police officers, which helped me kind of cement my philosophy of the police aren't always to be trusted. I had a lot of profs who were former police officers who were pushed off the force, who had experiences that were troubling for me as a as a student. So for me, that was very, that was integral to my growth at the school. And the second part of it was that as a part of the graduate requirement, you had to do some placements. So I had two placements at two fantastic law firms in Toronto. And that really helped me solidify criminal law as a kind of work that I want to do. And I do want to go to law school. And then from there, you actually applied straight into law school. I did. Yeah. Maybe I shouldn't have, but I did. And I got into one of the law schools that I applied to and it was all as good and it was my number one choice. So, yeah. Yeah. And so one of the stories that, that you've told me is that you didn't wait for the others. Osgood was your first choice. Osgood was my first choice. I tried a little bit to wait for yeah. uh, two of the other schools and they didn't get back to me. And at that point, I was like, is this for my ego? Why am I waiting for you? I know I want to go to Osgood. This is a program that I want to enroll in. And so I just accepted the, the offer. Yeah. You know, and I think a lot of people will be able to relate to that. I mean, I have I, I've been in the same position where, you know, you're accepted. I, I, I was actually in the same position as you as I was accepted to Osgood. And then I was like, like for a moment, like waiting, like, am I going to get into anywhere else? Whereas I knew I was going to go to Osgood. So you end up just like saying, OK, like this is ridiculous. Like, here's where I want to go. <laughs> and then and then we went and that's where we met each other. Yeah, we did. <laughs> yeah. And same yeah, same section. And I would say the rest is history, but we're going to talk about it. Yeah. So I don't want to move on from it too quickly. Let's let's just back up a, a minute. So before we we got into law school, we obviously had to do the application process. We had to go through the application process. So what do you remember about that process? I remember it was traumatizing. It mm -hmm. was not a fun experience. You really feel like you're in the dark getting to that experience. There's a lot of stuff that you just have never had to deal with, even applying to undergrad. And there's not a lot of resources out there that are objective and reliable that allow you to really put forward a good application. Yeah. And so a lot of my clients and even myself and perhaps you as well, going through these earlier application processes for me relied on Google. I mean, TikTok yep. and Instagram like weren't a thing. I like maybe I'm dating myself a bit, <laughs> but Google certainly was. And so yeah. you're Googling like how to, how to, how to write a personal statement, how to, what is an autobiographical sketch? And the answers that you get are unhelpful to say the least. And they're just a waste of time. Did you have that same experience where you're like grasping for any sort of guidance? Any sort of guidance, any forums, anything, anywhere I can find online, any information that might help me. I saw stuff from Harvard and I'm looking at their process. I'm like, that's a bit different, but I'm sure I can rely on the same information <laughs> for the Ontario schools. And <laughs> it was a nightmare. Yeah, it is. It is. And and so for me going through these processes, I know that like having somebody who's actually been through them and who's been on admissions committees would have been super helpful and would have saved time and mental energy 
And I would have had probably far fewer stomach aches, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would have slept better as well. Yeah, it would have been very, very helpful to have that at the time. Yeah. Because you know nothing going to the application, writing a personal statement, answering a couple of questions seems quite easy, but it's a very daunting and onerous task. Yeah. And it's I think it's really important to just draw out that there really aren't resources for applicants. Yeah. There aren't reliable resources for applicants, certainly. And because of that, like think about the number of applicants every year that are applying to these like life changing programs that are going to set them on this new trajectory for their lives. And there's zero guidance. So think about how many people are stressing out and how many people are like are, you know, struggling through these processes. I mean, it's it's there. It's there's a much bigger picture here. Yeah. There is. And the other part about that is the expense of applying to all these schools, because if you don't have a strong application, that one that you can feel confident in, I mean, you're going to apply to every single school you can because you just want to get in somewhere and you spend a thousand dollars, two thousand dollars on these applications. And I mean, if your application isn't strong, it doesn't matter. It's reapply. It's just a it's just a nightmare that could be resolved if you had some upfront resources. Yeah. And an arm and a leg on prep courses for the standardized tests. (laughs) Yeah, it's and so, you know, applicants are spending all this money with no guidance about like yeah. the actual written application, which is a huge part of, of the application. It's not just about the scores. We all know that they exist, but it's not just about that. It's also about who you are and and showcasing yourself and advocating for yourself and, and speaking to the significance of you and what you bring to the table. Yeah, I think that's what true me to Osgood because Osgood does have a holistic approach, I think it's in my view, from their application process. And the big part about that is that you can write a decent personal statement, but what they expect is they expect you to elevate that. They expect you to tell a compelling story, compelling narrative that is your truth about why you want to be a lawyer, why you want to be in law school, how you are going to use the knowledge and skills you have from law school. So I think for a big part for me was having a holistic approach going into writing my application. And You know, so many times with my clients, I see and even, you know, myself as a young, as a much younger applicant, because over time, I like I got really good at applications. (laughs) You know, now this is like what I do aside from my law firm. And something that I think is so important is that it's not just about like listing the things that you've done in in answer to questions. Yeah, it's much more substantive than that. It's much more, it's, it's much, it's much bigger than that. It is. You've really got to communicate and showcase who you are very authentically. And I like what you said. I think you said honestly. Yeah. Truthfully, like who you really are and what you really bring to the table. And so those short answer questions or those personal statements, whatever the case is, are really tough. Even the autobiographical sketch with that word, (laughs) with that letter limit, character (laughs) limit, it's tough. It's really it tough. So what do you, what, what for you? And, and I think that people will be able to re- relate to this. Certainly. What was the hardest part of the application process for you? Aside from the LSAT, I think it's the personal statement. Hands down, it was a exhausting process to write a finite amount of words and write it in a cohesive, coherent, cogent way that tells your story to the admissions committee. It's very, very difficult. It is because you start with a blank page. Like there's no guidance, like zero. It's not even that you have the structure of short answer questions so that you can even like answer to what they are looking for. It's a blank page. Yeah. And sure, there may be, t- you know, things the like guideposts that they give you in the description of, of the requirements, but really you're starting with a blank page. So in your, in your process of writing a personal statement, can you speak to the importance of reflection? You need to reflect before you even start writing, honestly, because you need to be able to communicate what your dreams are and what your message is authentically. And if you don't really have a strong grasp of what that looks like, it's it's not going to be a well-written piece. It might communicate to some degree some of your desires, but it doesn't, in a very cohesive way, it doesn't showcase, this is why I want to be aware. So you really need to consider what what your goals are and why you want to get to law school before you apply. Because I mean, besides the expense, it's difficult to to articulate that in a coherent way. 
with no mistakes. With no mistake. <laughs> no grammatical, no spelling mistakes, no formatting errors, like nothing. It's got to be really, really polished. And the other thing about that is that that's, it's a writing sample. That's one of the few pieces of writing that the school gets from you. There's a lot of writing in law. And if you don't have a well-written piece, then it's not going to, you can say what you want and it's not going to communicate the message you really want. Exactly. Undergrad essays that I wrote, I mean, I wrote three or four per semester in undergrad. It was a lot. That does not necessarily translate to writing a strong personal statement or a strong application and relying on the same skill set can harm your application. Yeah. And it's because it's a completely different skill set that you need to write an academic essay versus an application. Totally different. Yeah, I think that's so important that you raise that because the skills that it takes to write a compelling application, compelling personal statement, your autobiographical sketch, or even if that's not required, your CV or resume, these are really advocacy pieces where you are advocating for yourself. So how are you representing yourself in this piece? And it's again, it's not about just listing experience. It's really about showing them this three or four D version of your experiences in a way that really jumps off the page and says like, here's why I'm valuable. Here's why you should pick me. Here's why I belong there. Yeah. And I think part of part of what I wish I knew <laughs> at the application stage was that there are, there's going to be people who are much more qualified than I am. And by qualifications, I mean credentials and experience that, that people will be there. And that doesn't mean I don't belong, but it means you need to make sure that your application doesn't just rely on, well, look, I did X, Y, Z, and that's why you should let me into the law school because other people did X, Y, Z or even more. And that's just not enough to to compellingly convey your story. Right. So do you have a specific experience that you're thinking about? I, I do, actually. It involves you. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and it was it was on our first year and we were in the auditorium and it's probably the first week of law school. I don't remember why we were there. Yeah. We were talking and you told me you had your doctorate. And immediately in my head, I was like, I don't belong here. I know other people here who have a lot of master's degrees. And it was just this feeling of, I knew I didn't belong here. I knew this was a mistake by Osgood. They mailed me an acceptance by accident. And now, I mean, they're stuck with me, but now I realize I am, I don't belong here. But I mean, in talking to you, I realized quite quickly that you were, and you were the kind of person that was humble you were very nice and very easy to deal with. You kind of put me at ease that, you know what, maybe, I, I don't even think you knew this at the time. But no, you put I have me no at idea. Ease that uh, I do belong here. This is just, you're just another person who was here. You're here to share the same experience with me. And I think that was a, a foundational point for me where I said, okay, I know I didn't think I belonged here, but maybe I do. We're just all in the same boat. We're all trying to figure this out. No one here has a doctorate in law. So we're all here to figure out at the same time. So, I mean, okay, so a few things. Thank you for sharing that. I, I had no idea that, that you, that you felt that way and that, that this experience had, like, I remember talking to you and like my thought was like, oh my gosh, he is so smart. Like, I don't belong here. (laughs) And like, I looked around and I was like, look at all of these smart people. Like, obviously, like, how am I here? You know, like we're all in the same room together. Like, you know, so I felt much the same way as you did in reverse. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so it's so funny that that you raise this because I, you know, and then as soon as you and I spoke, I was like, oh, he's so cool. You know, like I want to be friends with <laughs> Thank him. Thank you. <laughs> so, so I think that it's, this is such a good sort of like lesson in the fact that you never know what other people are thinking. Yeah. And everyone has insecurities. Everyone at one point or another, especially in these big periods of growth, are uncomfortable. And have these, uh, have these feelings of insecurity and I don't belong. And, and, you know, do they know they let me in? You know, when, are, when are <laughs> yeah. they going to realize that this was a big mistake? And I just remember, you know, like in that, it was probably around like some sort of orientation thing in the first week. Yeah. I just remember like also looking around and thinking like, you know, as I said, that like I'm in a room of really smart people that can be really intimidating. And for me, it, I, I, it didn't even cross my mind that I had like all this other, all these other credentials and that, you know, I was a professor in the next building. Like that didn't even cross my mind. What crossed my mind was, oh my gosh, look at this sea of really smart people. And then, you know, once you talk to people, you realize, oh, like this is, this is more comfortable. We're, we're here together. 
So I think that it's really important that we draw on the importance of not having a scarcity mindset and and instead focusing on what everyone can bring to the table, like realizing that everyone is there for a reason and realizing that, you know, very quickly for me that like, these are my peers, these are my colleagues. And, you know, I never, first of all, I never imagined that like we would be speaking on a podcast episode some years later, like <laughs> that, that, that was just like, that's not even something like this podcast is not even something that would have entered my mind. But yeah, the fact that like you and I would be sitting here together having this conversation is something that is so far fetched from where we started. We never know what's going to happen and where we're going to end up and who we're going to end up there with. We're going to end up there with our colleagues. So, I mean, yeah. we need to be kind to everybody and we need to be kind to ourselves, especially during the first year of law school. It's, oh, yeah. it's grueling and you don't know anything. And so, I mean, I, I totally agree with you. Yeah, it's it's yeah. It, the first year of law school is leaves leaves a lot to be desired. <laughs> <laughs> to put it mildly, it's yeah. really stressful. Let's be honest about it. It's really stressful. You're thrown in to this brand new institution with its own institutional culture with, and, and I, I mean specifically, you know, you could talk about anything in terms of institutional culture, but I'm talking in terms of how classes are, how your grades, you know, how you're graded, the curve, like all of these things that now dictate everything you do. Yeah. And having to, I remember there was one experience also probably in and around the same time that you and I had our very first conversation that we just talked about, where everyone's talking about summaries. Everyone's talking <laughs> about summaries. Yeah. And like everybody's saying like, I need to get the summary for torts. And I'm like, we haven't even started class yet. Like, what is a summary? I didn't know what a summary was. And I felt stupid for yeah. not knowing what a summary was. Like, really, you know, you hear, hear people talking about it, but you don't really know what it is until you see one. I hadn't seen one. So I actually went up to the associate dean at the time because I was so shy to ask my peers because I felt stupid. Like, I like, how could everyone know this? And I don't. And uh, I said, you know, can you just tell me, like, what is a summary? <laughs> <laughs> and the associate dean was so kind. And he said to me, it's just, it's just like literally notes from a class that you prepare in order to write an exam. And I thought that is so much better. <laughs> like, I get that. I get that. Yeah. And then, you know, we get, we get, we go through classes and we start to, you know, get to, you know, around exam time and people start talking about summaries. And so what was your experience around this? Because I think that this is a real source of exam time and summaries in law school are a real source of scarcity mindset, I think, where everybody, because we're at Osgood, it's arguably, I think, the hardest curve in Ontario. I don't know compared to other jurisdictions, but where you place on that curve ends up really putting students who are peers into this really competitive place. So what was your sort of experience around that piece of, of law school? Yeah, I, I had heard stories from other students, not, not necessarily at Osgood, but other students who realize that the summaries that they were given from friends or from colleagues contained false information, contained deliberately false information. For me, that was a, that was that scared me enough to not really rely on other people's summaries and prepare my own. I had some colleagues I was able to rely on. I knew that they would give me helpful information that whatever summary that they prepared on the topic or on the class could be reliable. It was a daunting process because preparing a summary isn't intuitive. If you don't really know what you're doing, you're going to put two, three hundred pages of notes together and call it a summary, print it off and go write an exam. And that's not helpful at all. But you don't know that as a first year. And unless you have some resources, you are in trouble. Yeah, some resources or or somebody you can trust who's actually been there before you. So that's really important. And, you know, I agree with you. First year, I mean, those exam times were the most stressful <laughs> of yeah. any exam time that I've ever done, ever. And I think, you know, certainly after first year, you get into your groove a bit more. Yeah. You realize, OK, I can do this. You know, these summaries, I can I can do them. I can make them, you know, and, and if you do make your own summaries, then, you know, like I did, you, you essentially write your notes during class in a way that they translate directly into your summary with some editing and revision and, and what have you. But but you really get into your groove and. Second and third year were actually a lot better for for that. And also in second and third year, you can choose a lot more of your courses. So you can choose more essay classes and classes that you really 
enjoy. Did you find that as well? I did. I took a heavy crim crim load of classes and it my marks increased significantly yeah. in my second and third year. I was happier in my second and third year. I was able mm-hmm. to take on more volunteer work. I was able to sit on committees because at that point I knew how to study. I knew how to write, right. it, like how to listen to the lectures, what information I need to take from the lectures, how to take good notes, how to read material in a way that I digest it. I'm not just reading something that I need to read two or three times before I understand it. By second and third year, having choice in your courses, that made all the difference in knowing what you're doing. It's still hard in second and third year, but you know what you're doing. It's First year is, I don't think, any harder per se, except you have no idea what you're doing. So you're trying to figure out how to do this thing and you have no help, no resource. Right. And I think, you know, one really good example of that was contracts for me. I don't know if you remember that class. I'm not going to call out <laughs> who was teaching it at the time, but I just remember we started at the end of a yeah. contract. We started at like, okay, what happens at a breach of a contract rather than starting at the beginning, which is, you know, like offer acceptance, a meeting of the minds, like that whole thing. Yeah. And so we're, we start at the end and I was like, what, how did we get here? Like, how do you get here? Like, how do you get to a breach of contract? And this is, of course, you know, a mixture of teaching style and 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 teaching philosophy. But you get to first year and I'm thinking, OK, like I have all this education behind me and I and I like somehow I don't understand what a contract is. And now <laughs> contracts is like a whole like a whole bunch of what I do, like at, at yeah. my firm. Like contract, I'm writing contracts every week. And yet, like I think back to contracts and I'm like, I'm never going to write a contract. Yeah, (laughs) I'm never going to do this. And here I am doing it competently. And so I think this speaks to how really how in a really stressed out state you are in first year where you're learning all these things with new language, new writing, new everything. And just as you go through the your journey, you pick up more skills and you get more comfortable and and you begin to realize, yeah, I, like I can do this. It's not it's not it's not like I thought it was or it's not that bad. You yeah. know, like right, I love writing contracts. Like it's so much fun. <laughs> I still haven't fallen in love with writing contracts, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've Maybe fallen in love with other work. Yeah, I, I really do love crim law. Yeah. And, and so I think that that's so important that you know, we all start in the same classes, sort of like slogging through, you know, that same first year. And we find things that we really, really enjoy in practice, yeah, right? Absolutely. So that course that you might not have done amazing in or, you know, your LSAT score, like nobody cares. No one cares. <laughs> nobody cares. The, the, the second that you start law school, you never talk about the LSAT again. And the people who do are ostracized. Do not bring up the yeah. LSAT. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because everyone's traumatized. So everyone's yeah. like, keep that away from me. One thing we learned from a professor who taught constitutional law was that law school isn't that hard. It's really relentless. And I think what he meant by that was that, I mean, you can learn the materials yourself. You can attend class. That part isn't the difficult part. The difficult part comes from finishing up all your essays. And then the next thing you have to do after that is do some readings. And after you do your readings, you have to prepare for an exam. You try to sleep. You try to have a social life. And all this is happening at the same time. And it starts from the first day of law school, essentially, up until the time that you finish your last exam. And it's relentless. So for me, I mean, I enjoyed law school quite a bit, but it was indeed relentless. And then you do have the bar. After and then that. you do have the bar. So like, so you finished class. I think what happened was we graduated and convocated and then like immediately we had the bar, like almost yeah. immediately. So you're finished exams, but then the next thing is this like massive two day standardized test that you're again thrown into without any guidance. Without any guidance. And you're sent 2000 pages or so of material to digest and write an exam about and you have no idea what you're doing. Yeah. Nightmare. <laughs> but I think that this this concept of being relentless is really important because it's the the feeling that many of us have, myself included, is like, okay, there's one more thing. There's one more thing. There's one more thing. There's always one more thing. Yeah. There's always one more thing and or several things <laughs> that are all coming up at the same time. Yeah. And the part of the skill that it takes that we develop over time is the ability to manage all those things. And that skill takes us into our practice because, as you know, dealing with several files concurrently, there's always one more thing or several things. Or you've got two trials in the same month. 
or, you know, at some interval that seems impossible, but through skill and a lot of hard work, we manage. Yeah. Right. So I think that this is a really interesting idea that, you know, law school itself is not that hard. What what the hard part is, is having everything together, all like having all of these requirements so intensively together all the time and just wanting that break. And I mean, God forbid something happens in your personal life that takes you away for a week or two or longer. I mean, trying to get back on your feet is a difficult task. And I I agree with you having the skill set to be able to navigate that and be able to prioritize. It's difficult and it's something that you need to learn in law school. Mm -hmm. So when you were going through law school, we obviously went through other application processes. So you know, for summers, for articling, for jobs after articling. How did you, how did you find those application processes? For summer, I was lucky because the person to whom I did my placement with an undergrad was able to hire me on for a summer. And I did Mm -hmm. an inquest with him, a coroner's inquest Mm. with him. That was fantastic experience. I mean, doesn't get better than that. And now from that experience, I've been able to translate it to an inquest that I'm going to do in May of this year. Mm. Same lawyer, same kind of trajectory. So, I mean, for me, that was fantastic. That was my first year. I didn't have to apply to, I didn't have the grades to apply to any places in the summer or so I felt at least. If we could just pause on that point, because I think I also realized that in order to be a successful lawyer, you don't need to get straight A's. Like up until law school, we all got straight A's basically, right? Like with some exceptions perhaps, but we all basically were like high achieving students. And Then I remember when I was in like maybe like as I was going into law school and I was like nervous about whatever everybody's nervous about someone who was a partner at a big downtown law firm told me, you know, I was getting like C's in law school. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, what do you mean? So it's just so interesting that we all have this perception that anyone successful or like whatever version of successful you're looking at, I'm using air quotes, got like straight A's, but that that didn't happen. So, you know, and after you're done law school, nobody asks for your grades anymore. Yeah. You know, so I think that that's just a really important point to just stop on for for people who are listening, who may be applying to law school or even going through law school and who are like stressing out about like getting an A or A plus, you know, it's it, it's so tough to to be in law school, period. It is, honestly. And so just to to have that sort of comfort that like, You'll be okay. You'll be okay. One of my mentors who's a judge, he does criminal criminal work. He was the director of a youth crown office for a while. He did private defense. He did everything. And this was when I was doing the criminal intensive at Osgood in second year. I remember you did that. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Because you were always telling me these amazing stories of what you were working on. And I thought, oh, <laughs> wouldn't that be fun? I mean, criminal wasn't my, wasn't my, you know, wasn't my niche, but, but Every time I spoke to you about what you were doing, it made me want to switch. (laughs) It's always, always, always fun. Always interesting. Always complex. It's fun. (laughs) But he was saying that he applied for the intensive back in when he was an Oscar student and he didn't get in and he was making a joke. He's like, I don't know why they didn't want me. Maybe it was because of my C's in all of first year, but I don't think that was it. I think it was something else. And he is now a criminal judge. He is doing quite well for himself. I mean, there's always a story about Justice Moldaver that he had did poorly in his first year and now he's a Supreme Court judge. So that kind of stuff really motivates me to think my grades need to be good, but they don't need to show. I don't need to be the best at everything. I don't need to have A's in everything. I just need to put in the work that he could put in. Yeah. You know what actually was my sort of driving force when I was studying in law school? And when I was in class, my my sort of philosophy and my my motivation was how can I go through this class and and learn everything that I can to to be a good lawyer for my client. So for me, I actually had to completely change my thinking away from I have to get this grade because that for me was like a non-starter. As soon as I started thinking about grades, it was so hard for me to sit down. So yeah. instead, I had to think of myself as okay, you are a sponge. You need to absorb everything that you can so that when you get into practice, you can be the best lawyer that you can be. That was how I sort of got around the mindset of grades and competition in that way. And it also made law school much more enjoyable because you're, it's, that's possible, (laughs) 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 which I think it is because, because you start to, to see 
the courses that you're taking in law school as skills development rather than about grades. Because I'd been through so much school at that point that for me, I was like, okay, I have like the grades. Okay. But like, what else? Yeah. What else? And like from grad school, I think probably coming from grad school where they, you know, I got grades up until a certain point because I was taking coursework. But once you're done coursework and you're doing your own research, there's no grades anymore. Then it's, are you, are you an expert in your area? And that's what ends up counting. That's what, that's what your dissertation defense is all about. That's what your master's thesis defense is all about is, are you an expert in this area? So for me, I think I was able to continue with that mindset of what can I learn? First year was hard regardless. But I think once I got over that hump yeah, and into second and third year, like you said, we're able to get into a groove where for me, the way that I framed my studying, my learning was, okay, how can I be the most effective professional that I can be? And yeah. I found that that helped a lot. It's a very good way to look at it. And I mean, in some ways, I, I think I did too. I wasn't yeah. too focused on my grades because I mean, what, I don't know what they're going to do for me later on in life, <laughs> but the skills I learned yes. for me, especially in the criminal law classes, it was, I need to make sure I know all of this because I don't want to go to court and not know this stuff. And yeah. it's, it all seems important to know. So it, was, it really was about, I need to learn as much as I can in the best way that I can to make sure that I have all this, I have this knowledge or I have resources I can rely on to, yes. to access. Yeah. And I just remember, I, yeah, we took one or two crim classes together at least. Mm-hmm. And we had some of the, some really amazing props. We did. <laughs> we had some really amazing props. I don't know if we can, you know, call them out on the podcast, but they were, they were unbelievable for sure. I mean, those, those skills that we, we learned in those classes and my other classes, I mean, were so certainly in second and third year and in, and even in first year, one of our crim classes yeah. was in first year. It was, it was great. It was fantastic. Great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So as you went through your, journey. We're still going through our journeys. They never stop. How, what was the role of mentorship for you? The role of mentorship for me was huge. I, again, no one in my family was a lawyer. I didn't have anyone I can just really reach out to. I had a couple of lawyers who I knew by this point because of my placements, but really developing good mentors in law school was foundational for me. I needed it. I needed it. A big part of why mentorship for me was helpful was because it allowed me to plan for my future. It allowed me to have someone who's been there help me plan for my future and help me see what my targets are, see how I can get there, see what's best for me in terms of what my journey can look like and what I wanted to get out of it. Yeah. So what are maybe a few takeaways that that you that have stuck with you from some of your mentors? A lot of people don't have fantastic grades in law school. It doesn't matter. A lot of lawyers kind of mellow out after a couple of years and they don't continue to try to develop. And they are just, so there's lawyers, there's average lawyers. And if you want to be better than that, if you want to do serious kinds of cases, you need to really work at it and you need to work outside of school. You can't just read the books and think that's the end of it. And for me, that was volunteering as much as I could of during law school and not everyone has the time to do it. Not everyone has the flexibility to do it. But if you do, then I think that getting involved in the kind of work you want to do outside of law school really informs your education in law school. It allows you to read the material in a different way. For me, like for crim pro material, reading that in a different way, and then taking that crim pro material and the evidence law that I learned in second year, first semester, and then translating that to the crim intensive the following semester fantastic because I was like, I know what I'm talking about now. I know what an Edgar statement is because I remember learning about it and I'm now able to apply it in real time, it felt like. Yeah, the same thing happened to me. So I I also was able to secure the same summer position throughout law school. And and so I was really lucky there. And in, in civil litigation, which is which is the area that I continue to practice today, I practice civil litigation and business law and health law. And taking evidence, taking, you know, Civ Pro 1 and 2, while you have this experience, helps you to be able to say, oh yeah, I worked on this file and this we used, we relied on this rule. Here's where it fits in practice. It's so valuable. So I think, you know, everybody is so 
was so worked up about getting that summer position. I need that summer position. But it's not about the summer position for sake of a summer position. And so I think actually what what a really good piece of advice for law school students who are applying for summer positions, I think a really good piece of advice for them, and you can maybe comment on this too, is be really purposeful in where you're applying because it's not just about the job. It's about yeah. like, what do you want out of it, right? What do you want out of it? What kind of experience do you want out of it? And what do you want to do with that? Yeah. That's what it's about. And so being a lot more present and mindful and thoughtful about these big choices that you're making, because I know a lot of people who apply to like 50 firms, even more, even outside of this jurisdiction, in order to like just get any experience at all. And then the experience that they got ended up like pigeonholing them or it wasn't in the area that they wanted. And, you know, that that doesn't stop anybody from pursuing the area that you want to pursue ultimately. But what I would say is be very purposeful about your choices and and your goals can change. Like that's that's OK, too. If you try this out and you don't like it, that's OK. Try something else out, but be purposeful about the choice. What do you think? I absolutely agree. I applied to quite a few crim places. And and I mean, you've been to the OCI process. You know what it looks like. I didn't apply during the OCI process, but everyone was saying, just apply, just apply, just apply. And it's that pressure of not being purposeful in what you want to do. I knew I didn't want to do corporate work. I wasn't going to apply to corporate places. I knew I didn't want to do civil litigation, broadly speaking. So I didn't apply to civil litigation places. And it for me, it was, I need to ignore the noise I know what I want to do. I know what kinds of places I want to work at. I know what kinds of cultures I want to work with. And I mean, I'm open. If I, if I applied to CRIM and I didn't like it, I would have moved away to somewhere else. And I took classes that were different than CRIM because I was like, I want to make sure I have a fairly well-rounded outlook on justice, outlook on law. But I agree with you. You need to be really purposeful because it's you can apply to 50 places again exhausting. It's so much work to put together one good application, putting together 50 good applications. I I don't know how you can do it. I don't know how you have enough time to put together 50 good applications. So especially that are so competitive, especially yeah. at these, some of these firms that are so competitive, putting together a long application 50 times. You can't just change the name of firm and call no. it a day. So you really need to invest your time in the firm when you're making this application. For sure. And I think it's so important that this conversation about mindful and purposeful choices is is that, that we're having it because you know some clients that I work with are lawyers who are yeah. unhappy because they had this very linear trajectory that they didn't really question do I want to work in this area I just want to be a lawyer okay well what does that mean you could be a thousand different kinds of a lawyer like what does this mean so some of my clients are lawyers who are switching fields who and and we're working it it takes time to switch fields because if you're specialized in one area then you we need to get you some experience we need to get you some some certifications some credentials that helps you bridge that gap what those are have to be really strategic and really purposeful and the my clients that I've seen who are making this transition because they're not happy where they are or in the field that they're happy in, or even as a lawyer more generally, end up stuck and a decade passes and they sort of wake up and they're like, what am I doing? I hate this. Whatever it is, you know, other people could love it. You could hate it. It doesn't matter. The point is that you should do what you want to do and being purposeful about those choices and being thoughtful about your trajectory from the beginning is so important. And that sometimes means being choosy. I'm not going to apply to 50 firms. I'm going to apply to three. Like I know so, so many people during my OCI process for, for anyone listening, OCI stands for on campus interviews. I, I talk about this in a previous podcast episode a little bit more, but for anyone who's going through those processes, I know I knew people who had applied to like 40, 50 firms. And by the end of that process, like don't forget that process. It's, it's a, it's a, pretty standardized interview process that takes place at one location on over a span of a few days in different cities across the province. And these people who were engaging in this process who had applied to like 40, 50 firms, I had applied to three for comparison because I was extremely purposeful about where I wanted to apply and where I was going to spend my time. But for those people who applied to those 40, 50 firms, 
they were burnt out by the end of it. And then we jumped right into exam time. And so if I'm being really real, the substance use and abuse that I saw as a result of this was really, really distressing for me because at the same time I was, I was a professor with my own students. Yeah. And I have a ba- my background academically is in pharmaceutical policy and regulation. So I'm, you know, working on pharmaceutical policy, fraud, regulation, marketing, misappropriation and, and inappropriate prescription of medications. And then I'm seeing this happen in front of me because of this like pressure cooker of stress that is completely constructed and doesn't need to be structured in this way. Like if I can be critical of the process for a second, I don't think that it needs to be structured in this way. As in, I had a friend as well who went through that process and he, very, very intelligent, had stellar remarks in his first year and second year applied, had 20 or so interviews yeah. and got nothing at the end. Mm-hmm. Of it. And I mean, I could not imagine the heartbreak he felt. I saw the heartbreak he felt. And I'm, to myself, I'm thinking, I know this guy is brilliant, so yeah. I don't know why he wouldn't get hired at these firms. I don't know what happened. But I mean, it's really a distressing process. It is yeah. so competitive. It's so unnecessarily competitive. And I think that's what kind of turned me off from applying. It was, it was, why would I want to be part of this process that is, it's so typical of law school to be unnecessarily stressful and <laughs> yeah. we don't need to do it this way. And we'd be doing it for so long this way. We keep doing it and we can just do it differently. We can make this less stressful, less stressful for students. We can make this a process that students don't hate and look back on and think, I'm glad I got a job out of that position. Out of all of that, I'm glad I did. Or on the flip side, they think, I am so sad I didn't get a job out of this and it was so stressful for no reason. Right. And hopefully, perhaps at some point, this sort of dreamland of processes that you and I are hoping for would actually help students to grow instead of being this really unnecessary process. You know, I just remember that there was one person who who had like, maybe it was even the same person, I don't know, but who had like 20 or 30 interviews, got nothing. And they were, they were really relying on some substances. And I, and they were like wandering around one day. And I said, like, are you okay? And they were like, I got to go home. And I, I drove them home because I was yeah. like, this is, I, it was, it was really distressing. And I made sure that they were okay and everything. But, you know, I've seen this firsthand. And so this is why this is part of what has truly formed the foundation of the work that I do here at Apply Yourself as an advancement coach and strategist, because the work that I do with my clients is health focused. It's health driven and it's health conscious and mental health conscious. So that, you know, if you come work with me, my answer is never going to be, yeah, keep doing those unhealthy habits, using those unhealthy vices and, and using whatever it is in order to, you know, in order to either mask or provide some momentary whatever from the situation of stress. So that, that, th- these experiences were actually really foundational for me in the way that I advise, the way that I strategize, the way that I coach, because I've seen what it's like to support people who are in a mental health crisis. Like I've been called and I have, I have been in the emergency room with lawyers who have called me and said, I need help. And so for me, the way that I practice, the way that I advise, even the way that I practice a lot at my firm, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be the way that it is on TV, right? Like it doesn't have to be that way. And it doesn't have to be, we don't have to subscribe to this like pressure cooker of stress. We can be supportive in that environment and maybe work to change it, right? But I, I just, I see what it's like at the student level. I've seen what it's like at the professional level. That's not the only way. That's not the only way. So that's what we, that's part of what we focus on here. And I know that this was a bit of a tangent, but I think that it's a really important conversation to have because we can't, we really can't talk about practicing as professionals and not talk about health and mental health and well being. Absolutely. So what, what have you learned perhaps about that, about mental health well being through your journey, through your practice? Not everywhere focuses on mental health. Not yeah. all employers <laughs> focus on mental health. Yeah. Criminal defense in particular, I think, is pretty bad at replicating the same negative aspects of law school. It is discriminatory. It is a difficult place to work. Legal aid doesn't pay enough. There's a lot of issues in criminal law that 
could easily impact your mental health. And I think the number one thing I've learned about myself and learned about mental health is that you need to be very, very conscious of it. You need to be very conscious of vicarious trauma in this. There's a lot of sad, sad stuff that we look at all the time. You need to be very careful with that. And there's no shame. And obviously, there's no shame in getting a therapist, getting help, taking some time off, moving away from the profession, switching to a crown position, whatever it is that helps you do it because this profession is not worth it. There's other lawyers who can do the work and your mental health is not worth not worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. So what have you learned about yourself along the way? It's a good question. The first thing I'll say is I can do anything. I can put any, I can do anything I put my mind to. It is a liberating feeling to be able to feel that way about yourself. But at this point, I think after the LSAT, the application, law school, the bar exam. Oh, yeah. We didn't even talk about the bar exam. <laughs> okay. Maybe, maybe we'll have that conversation another day. <laughs> <laughs> bar exam is a nightmare. But I think after all of that, I need to feel that I can do anything I put my mind to. It might take a bit longer than other people, but that's fine. I'm not, I'm not here to compete. I'm here to do my best job for my clients. And at the end of the day, if I could do that, then I'm happy. And I think. I've developed in myself a feeling that I can do anything I put my mind to. That's one thing I think I've learned about myself. The second is that I am willing to work hard. I think it's kind of tied to the first one. It's I'm willing to work hard. I have always had to work what I feel like is exceptionally hard to get to where I am. I'm willing to keep doing it. And I mean, the stamina is there. I'll keep doing it because this is what I love to do. Criminal law is what I love to do. Helping people out who are powerless love, love, love doing it. And it's often people, a lot of our clients are racialized clients. My boss is Egyptian, so we have a lot of Arab-speaking clients. He also speaks French because he's superhuman, so he has a lot of French-African clients or some French-African clients and a lot of Black clients. And so for me, being able to work with this group of people, I mean, nothing better than that. And I'm willing to work as much as I need to, to make sure that I can give them the best defense. And the last thing I'll say about myself, learning about myself, is that there is a lot of growth that I have yet to do. Each year, I feel like I know a bit more and more. Comparing first year to third year, I mean, that's night and day what I know. But even comparing third year to the end of articling, it is, again, night and day. I feel like I know so much more at the end of articling. But I compare that to now when I think I knew nothing at the end of articling. You were an idiot. You didn't know anything about criminal defense. And I imagine in a couple of years, I'll look back at myself now and say, you knew nothing about criminal defense. You knew nothing about how to be a trial lawyer. And I mean, that for me, it's a good feeling to know I have a lot of growth to do. And hopefully I have a long, healthy career. That, that's all really important reflection, I think. So, so thank you for sharing that. Finally. What is one piece of advice that you would give your younger self? Or if you have more than one, feel free to share. Yeah. I mean, it'd be difficult to distill down to one piece of advice. That's a lot I wish someone could whisper in my ear when I was younger. And I mean, it depends on what period of life you're talking about. So I'll kind of, I'll start from earlier. I was younger. I'll be 14 or 16 and move forward. 14 or 16, I wish someone told me, don't take that, that deal that the Crown was offering and told me to just litigated, take it to court, because I know now looking back, I would have been acquitted because I didn't do anything wrong. So I wish I had that that piece of advice of, you can fight the state. You can, you can say no. You can just challenge this and go to court, but didn't know that. And kind of taking that principle of you can challenge a state, I wish I knew you could challenge authority in a broader sense of being able to advocate for yourself in a way that's meaningful. I think that's a big piece for me as a young Black kid and Durham and Toronto is you can advocate for yourself and you can articulate yourself in a way that you can you can speak their language and you can overcome what they have. Part and parcel of that is work on writing. I think I'm a pretty good writer nonetheless. I've again like undergrad I wrote four papers per semester essentially. It was a lot of writing. So I think I was able to hone in on that skill. But I think as being a good lawyer, you want to be an excellent writer. It's something you need to actively work on. You can't passively become a better writer. And it can't just be from repetition of papers. It needs to be a very deliberate process of improving your writing. That is a big one for me as well. Doing a lot of work now that I do with my boss is writing lengthy motions, writing lengthy appeals, writing complex issues. And to distill that in a way that the judge can read it and be on your side is 
a big part of good advocacy. So I think had I known that, I would have been I'd be better off now. But I it's my journey. <laughs> Being a bit more cognizant of where I am in my journey, that would be a piece of advice I would give myself as a kid and as a, as a student, knowing that my journey is not linear, apart from the fact that I went from high school, undergrad, law school, without space in between. It's it's not linear. Not everyone has the same approach. Not everyone has the same experience. And I need to really understand that. And it's, it's, a difficult, it's difficult to understand that. It's difficult to see that because you expect everyone else have went through something similar to you, but they're somehow doing better. They're somehow smarter than you. They're somehow more knowledgeable than you. Uh, so being a bit more cognizant growing up, I think I have that now, but having that knowledge, knowing that I'm not alone, we're all in this together, that is a piece of advice that I think is second to none. Mm-hmm. And I think that on that point, having that journey be nonlinear, I think I think that there are several different journeys that go on. So even though, you know, the, the academic journey may be linear, perhaps the mindset journey was not. Yeah, absolutely. So there are, there are, yeah, there are so many journeys that happen in parallel to each other and layered on top of each other that I think you make a really interesting point here that just because something looks linear doesn't mean that it was. Yeah. So I think that that's a really interesting point. I think that I think that's the better way to have phrased it. It is the kind of multi-layered and you see some layers and you compare that to other people and you say, well, they also did this, but somehow they're smarter than me. Somehow they know more. Somehow they have this experience. I don't know how they could have possibly done it. And it's really the way I used to review it and used to look at it was really reductionist. And it was really that one layer. But you're right that it is multi it's multiple layers of of growth and mine are mine and no one else in the world has my multiple layers of growth and I need to be cognizant of that. Rick, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I so enjoyed this conversation and maybe you'll come back. I hope so. <laughs> this has been eye opening for me as a process to be reflective of myself and what my process look like, what my journey look like, what I want my future to look like and what pieces of advice I want to make sure that are really instilled in me. Well, I would love to have you back. So let's make it happen. For sure. (laughs) Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Advancement Spot podcast. If you heard something today that helped you get one step closer to achieving the amazing life you want, and you'd like to learn more about working with me, I'd love to hop on a call with you to see how we can help you. So follow me on Instagram at applyyourselfglobal and send me an email at hello at applyyourselfglobal.com. I'd love to hear from you. Remember to subscribe so you never miss an episode, leave this episode a review, and share this episode with somebody you think needs a boost of inspiration and actionable tools to help them succeed. Thanks for joining me and see you next week.